Welcome to the pre-recorded meeting of the Alameda Bible Fellowship. The Bible is the Word of God and should be the daily authority of our lives. Join us as we consider the Word of God, the Bible. All right. Yeah. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, again we come to thee, O Father. We are so grateful again that we can call upon thy name and that we can call upon thy name and we can call upon thy name. In other words, that we never wear out our welcome to thee. But, Father, we know we must come to thee with a broken and a contrite heart. We do not come to thee in our pride. We do not come to thee boasting. We don't come to thee... Uh, trying to tell thee how great we are or how good we are, but we come to thee recognizing that we're sinners and that the only, only mercy that flows into our life is because of thy mercy, O Father, thou who art the creator of the world. How can it be that thou art so merciful to us? And Father, we thank thee for thy word. My, my, how great thy word is particularly as we know that it comes from thy mouth, and therefore it is absolutely true and trustworthy. Oh, Lord, we know many times we don't understand it, but we even think that it gives us another opportunity for real thanksgiving because we know, as we do understand anything, it has to be because thou hast opened our spiritual eyes, thou hast given us understanding, we never, never, never can take any credit for ourselves. O oh, Father, how gracious thou art. And now, Father, we ask a blessing on this hour. We pray that all that we teach may be faithful to thy word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. During these past several weeks, we our, uh, focused our eyes on, on the nation of Israel. We got into that for several reasons. One of the reasons is when God talked about uh, making the two sticks into one stick, and we found that yeah, that uh, was not only talking about the nation of Israel, but it was also talking about all the hundreds of different denominations and congregations that all had their own uh, idea of what the truth of the Bible really was, and that now we are at a point where there's only one truth, one truth. But as we talked about the nation of Israel, we, we, we were quite amazed at how their end, finally their legal end, it coincides with the church end. We found that, uh, that uh, they were uh, allowed one more opportunity uh, to prove themselves, and, and uh, finally in 19... Uh, 88, after 40 years of being a nation, their testing program was over. And then with a reminder of seven days that, you know, seven days, uh, and, uh, you have to get in the ark, you have to get in Christ. Then they also entered into the great tribulation period right along with the churches. But in the process of talking about the nation of Israel, we say again and again and again, that for 1,480 years, uh, they were the representation of the kingdom of God. And, uh, and uh, the, the fact is, so, uh, uh, if, if you've really thought about this, you would have said, oh, camping, you're, you've lost it, you missed it, because they, were a, uh, they became a nation in 1447 B.C., and Christ... Uh, uh, began the church age in 33 AD and when you add 447 to 33 sure you get 1480 but wait a minute now you got to subtract one year because uh, 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 there's no year zero and in actuality it wasn't 1480 years it is 1479 
And how dare you take that, those kind of liberties? How dare you talk about 1480 when it was 1479? Well, long ago I learned that you can't take any liberties with the Bible. You just can't write your own rules. You have to let God write the rules. And, uh, and God gave us a passage that shows us that at times God uses time in one way or another. Let me explain. Uh, for example, if I say that, uh, that an event occurred in 1910, the year 1910, and then I say that another event occurred in 1920, well, we subtract the 20 from the 19, or the 1910 from the 1920, and what do we get? 10 years. There are events that happen 10 years apart. But on the other hand, if we included both of the dates, included both of the years in 1910 as well as 1920, let's say it's an event that began early on in I'd say in January of 1910, and the other event occurred in December of 1920. Well, then we really have to add uh, uh, an extra year there and uh, make it inclusive so that it, we also have 1910 and 1920. And uh, uh, when we go from Old Testament to New Testament, that's what can what we, we do at times. We find that we add the two together as calendar years and have to subtract one year, and then we get from, uh, uh, from one year to the other. But if we include both years in, in the count, the beginning year and the end year, then we, sh uh, we have to add one year, and uh, even though we s uh, subtract the one, we still get, uh, it, it's, it still goes as if there was no no, uh, no year zero. Now, let me explain how God gives us a, a, a freedom to do these kind of things, these kind of things. And it was kind of amazing. Uh, this is something I learned years and years and years ago, uh, as, uh, and it has assisted greatly in working through the timeline of history. You need these kind of, of rules in order to make sure you stay on the right track. But in Matthew chapter 1, God does something that uh, we are normally not aware of at all. And so we're going to spend this hour looking at Matthew chapter 1 because not only are we going to learn about this uh, business of adding a year, but we're also going to learn some other rules uh, from Matthew chapter 1 that assist greatly in understanding the Bible. Uh, Any time you, uh, uh, you have to follow what God will allow. You cannot write your own rules. But notice, in Matthew chapter 1, it says in verse 17. Go right down to verse 17. This incidentally, oh, let me say this ahead of time. Uh, it's amazing if you read any commentary or most commentaries about Matthew 1, uh, the theologians of the past have always said, this is the royal line of Jesus, uh, as compared with Luke 3, where we find that it is the line through Mary. But this is the royal line that goes to Jesus. Well, as a matter of fact, when we, when we get through analyzing this, we're going to find out that it doesn't... Uh, it, it goes to Jesus through Mary. It doesn't go through Jesus through this royal line at all. It has nothing to do with being a royal line to Jesus, as we'll point out. Well, uh, but notice verse 17. All the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. Now go back to verse 2. Abraham begat Isaac. And start counting the names. We won't do this. You do this in your own home, uh, in your own homework. Abraham is number one. Number two is Isaac. The next one is Jacob, and then from Jacob we go to Judah, 
and then from Judah uh, to uh, uh, Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and so on. And you go from Abraham to David, inclusively all the generations from Abraham to David, we get 14 generations. You'll find it, it'll count out 14. Then in verse 17 it says, uh, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. All right, go back to verse 6, Jesse begat David. We've already counted him now in this counting. And, uh, and now, so we're going to go from David to the carrying away in Babylon. So we have to start, we can't start with David. We've already counted him. We're going to start with with uh, Solomon. And so Solomon is number one. And uh, he begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abijah. And we, to further confuse matters, these are the, the names of the kings of, of Judah uh, in, from a Greek uh, translation, whereas in the Old Testament they're from a Hebrew translation. And so sometimes it's a little bit hard to compare with the Old Testament immediately. But we go from Solomon through to verse 11, and Josias begat Jeconiah and his brethren. Now, Jeconiah is, if we go, if we start with Solomon, is number one, and then we go uh, to uh, Rehoboam is number two, and finally we get to Jeconiah. Uh, he is number 14. He is number 14. Now, if we start, uh, then it says in verse 17, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Christ is the end time generation. All right, so because, uh, and uh, it's not because he was in the line of these kings, but because uh, because they, because uh, uh, Jacob, or Joseph rather, married Mary, uh, who was of the tribe of, of, of uh, who was of a, uh, 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 tri uh, the uh, tribe of Judah, and, uh, and uh, uh, excuse me, because she was in the line of David, excuse me, she was in the line of David, and that, and that brought us to Christ. So we can't start at Jeconiah. We've already named him in the second 14. We have to start with uh, Jeconiah begat Salathiel. We, we know Salathiel in verse 12 is number one, and then Zerubbabel is number two, and finally we get to Christ, and lo and behold, we only have 13. 13. And yet God says from the carrying away of ba and the Babylon or into Christ are 14 generations. Now notice what we've done. We haven't named anybody twice. We went from Abraham to David, then from the son of David who was Solomon to uh, to uh, 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 from Solomon to Jeconiah, and then from Salathiel, who is in verse 12, who is the son of, of Jeconiah, to Christ, and we got 13. And yet God says here in verse 17, from the carrying away into Babylon under Christ, are 14 generations. So how are you going to get 14? It means we got to name re, uh, we have to name Jeconiah a second time. He was used in getting to the number 14 from David to Jeconiah, and now we have to use him that name again to go from Jeconiah to the Lord Jesus and get 14 generations. Now, it, it's permissible because the or, I mean, God is making it permissible because when you go from one name to another, 
you it can be inclusive because this would be inclusive. We've used Jeconiah a second, uh, 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 including him, instead of going from him to uh, to Christ. We have included him again. So that's one rule that we learn from this. If God does this, if God does this, and you can read this again and again and this and count again and again and again, and there are only 41 names. There are not 42. There's only 41 names from Abraham to Christ. And yet he says in verse 17, uh, 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 so all the generation from Abraham to David are 14, from David to carrying away of Babylon are 14, and from the carrying away unto Babylon are 14. Twice it was that we didn't use the idea of, of using a name a second time, and then the third time we had to do it. So God is giving us permission to sometimes look at the, the periods of time in an inclusive fashion. So when we say that Israel became a nation in 1447 and then add 33 and we get 1480, that's inclusive, that is permissible, and 1480 has real meaning, whereas 1479 has no meaning. In fact, when we look at 1,480, it's a scary number because if we break it down, it's, uh, it's uh, divided by 2 and you get 740. Divide 740 by 2 and you get 370. And 370 is 10 times 37. 10 is completeness. And what is 37? What is 37? It has, and the number two, of course, has to do with those who have been called upon to bring the gospel. And, uh, and, uh, but 37 is the number of destruction. Remember, the world was, uh, uh, Noah was in the ark 370 days. And it was, he was in the ark because the uh, world was destroyed by water. Remember, Sennacherib had an army of 185,000, and when you bust that number down again, you get 37 times 10 times 2, or no, times 5, times 5. And, uh, and uh, there again, the number 37 has to do with destruction. And what was the end of the nation of Israel? They were destroyed. They uh, right up, and, but it, it didn't happen it didn't happen at the time of the cross. Oh, there was a destruction, but remember, God gave them one more time, and in 1980, uh, 1948, they became a nation again, and they were allowed a 40-year testing program, and now they are headed for the day of judgment, just like the churches are. But while we're looking at this chapter, there are other rules that we learn. Uh, one of the other rules is that from time to time we see the word begat. Abraham begat Solomon. We read here, or begat Isaac, rather, in verse 2. Abraham begat Isaac. What does that mean? He gave birth to Isaac. He wa Isaac was the son of Abraham. And when we look at that, we have to say, well, then... Uh, uh, and, and when we look at the word begat as it's found normally in a lot of other places in the Bible, you know, it talks about an immediate son. But notice when you go down to, uh, to uh, um, let's see, we go down to uh, in verse 8. Asa begat Jehoshaphat, and if you go into the Old Testament, you'll find, yes, Jehoshaphat was the immediate son of Asa. And Jehoshaphat begat Joram. Yes, Joram was the immediate son. I'm looking at verse 8 of Jehoshaphat. Now, here's Joram. It can be Georam. It's, it's, it's still the same individual. But then it says, 
Joram begat Ozias, or Isaiah, as he is called in the Old Testament. And when we go into the Old Testament, we find not so. There was not, he, Isaiah uh, 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 was not at all an immediate son of, Je of uh, Jehoram. He was a great, great grandson. Or, or uh, he was four generations down the way. In between were, uh, were uh, Ahaziah and Josiah, or Joash, as also he's called, and Amaziah. In fact, if we, went, if we look at the Old Testament, we would find that Jehoram begat Ahaziah, Ahaziah begat Joash, and Joash begat Amaziah, and Amaziah begat Uzziah. So, God has taught us something else. He's given us another rule. What is the rule? When you see the word begat, it does not at all necessarily mean an immediate son. It can mean a grandson or great-grandson or great-great-great-great-grandson. But uh, it's someone who is in the ancestral line, uh, who is... Uh, uh, this is the, he, that is, we are all begotten of Adam, if you will. We are, our line goes all the way back to Adam. So a second rule we have learned from this chapter. Then we, re we read something else. It's very interesting that God left out three names, the names that I just gave you, for he goes from, uh, from Jehoram to Isaiah. Why did he leave out Judah, or excuse me, Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah? Aren't they in the kingly line? Or why were they treated this way? And uh, then we learn something very interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, let me, before we get to that, let me uh, indicate something else. You know, Israel, or Judah, uh, it was a, it ran a very precarious business. Uh, it goes from David to Christ. Uh, that if we go to if we go to uh, um, if we go to Luke, for example, in Luke chapter three, in Luke chapter three, you'll find in, in except here it's done backwards. But if you, if you go from, uh, we find in, uh, um, no, you don't, oh, excuse me, I can't go back to, you, to Luke, because in the Gospel of Luke, the genealogical descent of Jesus includes none of the kings of Judah, except David. Just David. You look at, if you go down to, uh, let me see, where would that be? Uh, son of. Son of Isaac. I want, oh, here it is. In verse 31 which was the son, or which this be the equivalent of begatting, which was the son of Melchia, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Metatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of Jesse. Jesse. And that, uh, that's David, that's the king. And then David was the son of Obed, and Obed was the son of Boaz. He is the only king named in that line. The only king. And we wonder why that is, uh, 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 since this is the line of Christ, because it, it ends right up with Mary be, uh, begetting, uh, who was the son of uh, the daughter of, of uh, he, 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 Heli, and uh, who was uh, 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 who was the father of Mary. Now we uh, we find this. That in in um, the case of of uh, Solomon, 
Solomon committed a dreadful sin. In his old age, he worshipped other gods. What was the consequence of his sin? What was the consequence of his sin? God took the whole dynasty away from him with one exception. The exception of the tribe of Judah, well, along with the little tribe of Benjamin, which was uh, in part of Judah at that time. But ten tribes, the bulk of the nation of Israel, was taken away. And never again was were any of the ten tribes included in the kingly line at all. The line ended effectively only because of his promise to David that he would never remove the light and from David had to come the Christ, had to come the Christ, he did not take away the tribe of Judah because David was in the tribe of Judah. But insofar as the kingly line was concerned in the nation of Israel, uh, effectively it ended with the death of Solomon because God... Uh, God uh, uh, and, and that is why in, a, in the line of, 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 uh, of Luke chapter 3, you don't find any of the kings named except David because De uh, Solomon rebelled against God in his old age and God took the whole kingdom away. But there was another interesting time, and, uh, and again, we can't go into all the detail of this, we won't, but you, uh, when you, in your homework, read uh, First and Second Kings because you'll find this information there. But in First Kings, we find that there was a time when Judah and Israel, the ten tribes, became very, very good friends. They began to do things together. Israel was always a wicked nation. It never did become a good nation. It was always wicked. But the king, they still became friends. Do you have some close friends that are not interested in the Bible at all? We all do. You know, it's, that's, that, uh, that's not the final test of having a friend, if, whether they agree the theologically with us. Well, Israel and Judah. In fact, if you go through First Kings, it's baffling in a way because it uses the same names for a king of Judah as it is for a king of Israel. And you have to look a second and a third time. Now, which king was this? Was this a king of Israel or a king of Judah? It's like if you have a, a family friend, a family, and they uh, have a child and they name it Susie. Well, then when you have your little daughter, you might name it Susie because you like that little Susie over here. In other words, the names become very close to each other. And that's the way it happened in his day. But in the days of of Israel, there was a king named Omri. Omri. Now, in Israel, the ten tribes, the ten tribes, they had a series of 23 monarchs, uh, 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 but in ver but no dynasty that is not from father to son lasted more than four generations. Four generations. That was the limit. In Israel, I mean, in Judah. The dynasty went from David through Solomon and lasted for 22 generations all the way till, uh, till the, uh, or 22 or 23 generations. Uh, every, it, it, it never did change that, they, uh, that another dynasty entered. But there was a time when it almost happened. It almost happened. It was in when, King, when Omri was the king of, of, of Israel, of the ten tribes. He had a daughter named Athaliah. Athaliah. She, remember, you read about her, you know that name. She ruled a little while, even in Judah. She was a wicked woman. She was the daughter of Omri. And the, uh, the uh, fact is that Jehoram, who was reigning in Judah at that time, married Athaliah. Or married the daughter, wait a minute, yeah, he married Athaliah. 
Now this brought the two kingdoms together because Athaliah was the daughter of Omri. And now the nation or the dynasty of Omri has penetrated into the dynasty of Judah because Athaliah is the daughter of Omri and married the king of Judah. And this was a terrible thing because she brought all the sin also of Israel into Judah. And then her, her uh, after the next, th their children, of their children, there was a, a, a son named Ahaziah. He ruled a while. Now remember, his mama was Athaliah. His grandpa was Omri. He was in that line as well as being in the line of of uh, of David because uh, his his uh, uh, he, he it was only in 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 uh, uh, in uh, through Athaliah that Omri's line entered in and then Azariah uh, or Hezekiah had a son named Joash. And that's a whole story all by itself, how he reigned for 40 years, and, and uh, we're, we're not going to get into his story at all. But he was the grandson of Athaliah and the great-grandson of Omri. And then we find there's Amaziah, finally, Amaziah. Now, God has laid down a principle, and he's going to demonstrate it now through this situation. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. It's amazing how the, the Bible hangs together. Uh, a little piece here and a little piece there. I had a friend one time who wrote me and, and uh, deeply concerned. She said, Camping, you... you you take a piece here and you take a piece there and you take a piece there and you knit them together and, and then you come out with some kind of what you claim is true. Well, she had it right. That's exactly the way we do the Bible. We, we uh, use the whole Bible. But in Exodus 20, God laid down a principle. And we've seen it again and again. We've read it, read it again and again and we've never understood it. But it says here in verse 5 of Exodus 20, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, that is to other gods, or serve them. For I, Jehovah thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Unto the third and fourth. Now he doesn't always go up to the third and the fourth. Remember, when Solomon rebelled, he, he uh, took ten tri he virtually took the whole nation of Israel out of David's dynasty because of, of Solomon's sin, and that was immediate. And there are times when, uh, when some of the kings in, of Israel, uh, when they sinned, then God immediately went to another dynasty, or, or maybe that dynasty only lasted two generations. But the largest that God is talking about here is four, to the third and the fourth. And we've looked at that through the years and never, never understood it. But here God is going to demonstrate it. Because here you have Omri. And Omri uh, is his dynasty in Israel, which, is, which uh, uh, consisted of Omri and, uh, and uh, uh, let me see, in the nation of Israel, it was Ahab. God has an awful lot to say about Ahab. And then Ahaziah, and then a man by the name of Joram or Jehoram. And when uh, that's that, that, he was the fourth generation. Uh, then, in, uh, 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 remember that the dynasty of Omri had penetrated the dynasty of David because uh, through Athaliah being married to Jehoram. And so it goes from, uh, and her son was Ahaziah, 
And then Amaziah's son was Joash, and Joash had a son, Amaziah, uh, Amaziah, that's the fourth. And so at, then God raised up a man named Jehu and gave him the instruction to destroy the line of uh, Omri and, to dis and at the same time he ended the line, the fourth generation, into the uh, in nation of Israel. He, uh, he killed both Amaziah, the uh, son of Joash in Judah, and at the same time he killed Jehoram, the son of Ahaziah, in, which was the, uh, Jehoram was the fourth king in Israel in the line of Omri. Now here God is applying a principle that he enunciated in the, in the commandments that when, when I, I, I can take you out in the fourth generation, both in Judah, and this, this was a, a time when Judah was almost for the second time going to be destroyed. They almost were destroyed because of Solomon's sin. Now, because of Athaliah being, uh, coming from Omri and coming into the nation of, of Judah, uh, they are almost ready to be destroyed again. In fact, that's why in Matthew 1, these three kings who are the sons of, of, uh, of uh, who are in Omri's line are not even named. They're not even named. They're left out because that line has been destroyed. That's why they're left out of Matthew chapter 1. That's, that, and that, of course, also worked in God's whole plan of numbers and how he how how everything ties together in such a beautiful way but that's the reason they're left out is because they were in the line of Omri and and their line uh, officially uh, uh, in God's sight came to an end uh, uh, before uh, Isaiah became king uh, and and incidentally now we're learning something about the number four you know uh, I, I was thinking about this, <laughs> and, and it occurred to me, you know, from David to Christ, from David to Christ, when we go through all these names, we find 28 generations. Remember 14 and then 13? But if we, if we number David, uh, uh, wait a minute, 14, 27... Oh, yeah, from David to Christ, if we can, oh yeah, that's right, because we, uh, when we were getting the second 14, we started with Solomon. Now we're going to back up, we're going to start with David. From David to Jehoiakim was, uh, was uh, or, Je or Jeconiah he's also called, was uh, Four, from Solomon, rather, was 14. So from David, it would have been 15. And then there were 13 left, remember, to Christ. So 15 and 13. So from David, if we count David, include David, and go to Christ, you have 28. 28. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? What does number 28 signify? Break it down to two important numbers. Four times seven. When God says, I will visit your sins to the third and the fourth, he is effectively saying, I'm going to visit your sin to the very end of your existence. When, when uh, Adam sinned, how long would that sin continue? Or how long would that, uh, w w would it be before the descent, <laughs> let me say it the other way. How long before the descendants of, day of Adam would come to an end? Well, 13,023 uh, years, we know that. Uh, but that doesn't have anything to do with the number four. But on the other hand, uh, 
uh, when someone sins, their sin is visited to the third and fourth. And so number four signifies the very extremity of whatever. And that's when that, and that we could call number four. And the, uh, and the, the number seven is a number of perfection. Uh, the, that it'll be perfectly, the dynasty of man will have ended, had ended uh, in, in that period of time. This is why we, uh, this is why we, uh, now I've got to be careful, I'm going to get off and <laughs> on something here. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, when, when God, for example, when God uh, uh, wrote the Bible, we learned that the last word in the Old Testament was in the year 300-something, 90-something. I don't remember the exact time. And when we break that down, it comes out to 7 times 7 times 7 times 7. So there you have four, the four sevens, and you have the number 7. It is the completion of... Of, of this existence of the world tied in by the number four to the very end and seven, perfection. Uh, just like uh, uh, here, the completion of the dynasty of Omri was four, four generations. And now let me see, what else do we, can we pick up here? Um, I'm giving you so much material. I know your head is spinning like this. You uh, to, to tie it all together. But uh, just keep this in mind when you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and you will see that everything has been very carefully stated and, and the times and so on, so that God is teaching various principles that we can use as we are, have been working out the timeline. Uh, and I think, I think I've covered everything that I want to... Um, uh, I want to cover. Oh, I have to tell you that uh, uh, Judah, uh, we, we have to throw this in, Judah was cursed a, a, uh, a uh, uh, the line of Judah was cursed at the time that Solomon sinned, God was ready to take it away, and his mercy, because of David, he allowed it to continue. Then he was ready to take it away because of Omri's uh, dynasty entering in, and because of his mercy, he just took out four of the kings. And then one more time, and this time there was no mercy. If we go to, if we go to uh, Jeremiah 22, verse 23, Jeremiah or chapter, oh, I think it's Jeremiah 22. Jeremiah 22. We read in verse 24. As I live, says Jehovah, though Kaniah. Now, Kaniah is Jeconiah or Jehoiachin, he comes with three different names to further confuse us. Uh, oh, I'm, I just am utterly confident God did this deliberately uh, to make all of this difficult, and it's only in our day that all of this is really worth figuring it all out. As I live, says Jehovah, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. Uh, and he's saying, I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of the Chaldeans. And then he goes on, down to verse 28. Is this man Kaniah? That's, again, Jeconiah. A despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed? and are cast into a land which they know not. That is, they're totally under the judgment of God. Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah, write ye this man childless. 
a man shall not prosper in his days, for no man, here's the curse, no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Now that curse was pronounced against the last king of, of uh, Judah. Now, now notice, go back to Matthew chapter 1, and you see how God reinforces that. We read in, in uh, verse 11 of Matthew 1, and again uh, showing us how God ties things together. And Josiah begat Jeconias, that's Coniah, the one that was under the curse, and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And, and now remember, this is a genealogical line now that he's going through, getting down to Joseph, who was the, or the husband of Mary. And after they brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begat Salatiel, and Salatiel begat Zerubbabel. You see, read about it. Are these are the kings anywhere? This Salatiel? No, no, the line had come to an end, just as God had cursed it back in, Ju Ju uh, in, uh, in uh, Jeremiah 22. Uh, write this man down as childless, in, in, that is in the sense that, uh, what did he say? He said uh, in, uh, in verse 30 of Jeremiah 22, a man shall not prosper in his days for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Israel. And now we see here in Matthew 1 that as God goes through the kingly line, he, we don't find a king following Je Jeconiah. His line was cursed. And, and uh, uh, so uh, there again, God is demonstrating in Matthew 1 principles that he had enunciated elsewhere in the Bible. In other words, just, there's just a lot of information in this chapter. Uh, but And then the last thing is, in verse 17 or verse 16, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And because the line of the kings ended with Solomon. Remember? Remember Solomon? Uh, was, uh, was, uh, he lost. It, it was only the mercy of God uh, because of his promise to David that he allowed the kings to continue for a little while longer and then they finally uh, came to an end. So we go from David to Christ. David to Christ. And so throughout the Bible we find that God talks about Christ as David because David was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He reigned as king, physically, literally, for 40 years. The next king that was legitimate in every sense of the word in the line of David was Christ. Everything else was wiped out. It was all wiped out, as we have discovered here in Matthew chapter 1. The only one that is left is uh, Christ. And in order to get to Christ, he had to be uh, the, uh, the person in the line of all those kings uh, who was not a king at all, not at all, had no ruling authority, Joseph, uh, but he had to marry, uh, he had uh, to be married to, uh, to Mary but even there, it is, he didn't really give him give anything either because he was not the father of Jesus. He was simply married to Jesus. It was Christ who went from Jacob, or, or from, uh, from David to Christ without any human intervention in between. Without any human intervention in between. Uh, isn't that interesting? Going from David because Mary gave birth to Jesus not by, the, the, by uh, Joseph or by Joseph's father or anybody else earlier than that, but, but God was the one who, who was, was the father. And so you go from David 
in a perfect way to Christ. Oh boy, yeah, now are you now now that your head is spinning. We'll uh, we'll, <laughs> but just re- but I, I I went through this for a, a purpose, and that is you know a lot of people think that it's really easy to understand the Bible. They really think it's quite easy to understand the Bible after a while. You know, you, especially now in the days of computers, they can see where that word is used elsewhere in the Bible, and the next thing they think they're expert because they can find some other places. They have learned that the Bible is its own dictionary, and they've learned a few rules. But the fact is that the Bible is far more complex than that. Like this Matthew 1 has never been understood at all. It has nothing to do with the end of time directly, directly. But nevertheless, it has never really been understood. At least I've never read anywhere where anybody has ever understood it. But when we do look at it very carefully, and and, uh, you you don't have to use your computer either. (laughs) It It is just reading the Bible carefully, uh, and you, you get into, you learn all of this kind of information that we have gone through. Well, now next time, I promise you, uh, I won't take an oath, but I promise you that we will again go back to Ezekiel. The problem is, you know, I, I, I get started studying, and I start going down a path, and I say, hey, this is really interesting, and I've got to share this while I'm uh, while it's uh, hot in my mind, you know, because two weeks down the way I'll, I'll forget some of this. My, I don't have a a, per, a perfect mind by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, and so while it's still very fresh in my mind, I've got to share it. And you're just such a wonderful audience to share it with, uh, because you listen carefully. And you don't hesitate to nail me uh, uh, now or sometime after and say, yes, but. <laughs> and, no, oh, that's great. That's great because that keeps me honest. And, man, do I need a lot of help uh, that I'll do it exactly the way God would have us do it. Now, we're going to, let's look, see where we're going to be in Ezekiel. Uh, we're back in Ezekiel 38. And, and uh, like I said, one of the big things that we've just learned in these last few weeks is that when, when Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah, uh, when they're talking about the end, they're talking about the end of Israel, the ten, 12 tribes, just as much as the end of the church age, even though we're just, they're, they're just tiny compared with a third of the world's population being interested in Christ. But nevertheless, uh, the, the whole thing is brought to closure at exactly the same time. The number four applies uh, to both, all the way to the end. And so next time we're going to pick up, and we, we looked at the last time in verse 8, and, and, and remember, and as you uh, again uh, prepare uh, to uh, go back into this chapter, some of you I know would like to do a little, uh, do your own study, so you can, you're already alerted to catching camping when he makes a mistake you'll catch him right away uh, but the fact is that that uh, uh, when we when we were looking at this you remember that they were in verse 8 it's talking about being brought out of the nations and they shall dwell safely all of them and we saw that we have to understand that word safely means carelessly that they were not safe at all they thought they were safe and we'll define and develop that uh, uh, you know, for our next study. But uh, uh, right now, we're going to pause for, uh, <laughs> we're going to have a word of prayer, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank thee that, again, we've had opportunity to look into thy word. Oh, thy word is so glorious. Oh, Father, it's so wonderful every time we learn something. And Father, we pray that we may never take liberties with the Bible, but that we must have a basis for whatever we teach. And, and, and if we do that very carefully, then we know. And as, 
Yeah, we can do it very carefully. And if thy Holy Spirit is not guiding us, we're still not going to come to truth. Uh, but as thy Holy Spirit guides us, we do come to truth. And oh, we've learned so much, so much in these last days. And we pray that we may continue to persist through thy word. And maybe there are other things that thou will teach us above all, or at least in the meanwhile, as we're as we're continuing to study the Bible, we find reinforcement for many, many of the doctrines that we know uh, just in these latter days. And we're so grateful that when we find these reinforcements, because that is encouragement to us that, uh, that we are on the right track, that we are in, when we can find harmony uh, with, a, with a particular conclusion, with and find harmony with many other verses, then we are encouraged that thou hast indeed guide us in a right way. Bless us now throughout the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. When the unclean spirit is come out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and foundeth none, findeth none. Then he said, I will return, into my house from whence I was go came out, and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished, that is, it's very clean. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first, even so shall it also be with this wicked generation. Can you explain that and I'll sit down. Well, uh, there's probably many uh, points that God is making. One point is, is that, you know, a lot of people talk today about casting out evil spirits. Mm -hmm. And they have the theory that if an evil spirit is cast out, now that person is safe and mm -hmm. secure with Christ. That is not so. God is saying here, here you can have a person who had an evil spirit and somehow that evil spirit was forced to leave or did leave. And so there was no... And remember, there aren't evil spirits to go around for every human being. Uh, there's a great legion of them, a great number of them, but certainly not as many as there are people. Mm -hmm.